It's our pleasure to welcome our second speaker in this year's UHB ABR reading series, Casey Rectal. Let's see. Thank you for that amazing introduction, and thank you guys for all coming out. Uh, so I'm going to start. Um, oh, geez, this this book, this book um, that Jeff was mentioning, Intimates. Uh, destroyed my life. <laughs> it is a really it was a really hard book to write um, for a variety of reasons. I thought I was just going to read or create. I'm sorry, um, a few poems based on the photographs of Edward Curtis. This is um, one of Edward Curtis's photographs. Some of you guys will recognize um, his work as the um, PowerPoint that I presented. I'm going to present to you. Um, you'll see some of those photos. He was famous um, from last century. He was born in 1868, um, died in 1952. He photographed basically almost all of the American Indian tribes west of the Mississippi. And I had seen his book on a coffee table, and I grew up in, he actually worked in Seattle, and I was just so fascinated by his um, pictures. And I'll talk about a little bit why, but when I saw those photographs, I just thought they were beautiful, and I thought, I'll just write a few poems. But the more I read about him, and the more I learned about those photographs and what they mean, the more I realized I couldn't just do it with, with, with poetry. I had some, to do something else. And so I started trying to weave it into nonfiction, you know, just you know, fragments about what his life was like, Edward Curtis, and why he did what he did. And then that wasn't enough. And I thought, well, I've got to, I've got to figure out why this is important. Um, and I realized, oh, you know, weirdly, this sort of parallels something that's going on in my family's life. So then I ended up writing a bit of a memoir in there, too. And then I thought, well, something's, something's still missing. And then I, I did more research on him, and I found that one of his uh, guides, Alexander Upshaw, um, who is a crow, from the Crow tribe, um, was a very interesting and central figure in his life, in Curtis's life, and then so he became a central character in mine, and I'll talk about why. So then fiction entered in there, because there's not a lot known about Alexander Upshaw. So literally, this is a book that weaves memoir, poetry, nonfiction prose, um, and photographs, photographs both from Edward Curtis and um, photographs taken by other documenters, ethnographers, at the same time that Curtis was working as a kind of you know, back and forth conversation. So this became a nightmare. It's like an utter nightmare to publish, to create. But also, um, even though the book, I like to flatter myself and say it actually reads very well together, it's actually very hard to excerpt. So I created for you um, another literary form called a Pecha Kucha, actually. Some of you guys probably know what a Pecha Kucha is. Um, for those of you who don't, it was, um, it's actually a Japanese business proposal form. Um, the idea is that left on your own, businessmen will just go on and on and on. So they said if you're going to present a project, you get 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide to, to talk about your presentation. So this is what I've created for you, a, a look at this book. It's a Pecha Kucha, and you can tie me. It's 20 slides. 20 seconds per slide. This slide doesn't count, and what I just said. Um, and what I just said does not count, so this should take no more than about seven minutes. Edward Curtis was a self-taught photographer and ethnographer who compiled one of the largest hybrid texts in existence, the 20-volume North American Indian. The books include photographs, histories of tribes and individuals, recorded songs, stories, religious rituals. His financial backing came from J.P. Morgan. Curtis photographed almost every tribe west of the Mississippi. It took him 40 years of his life to complete. Curtis's father was an itinerant preacher who'd fought in the Civil War. The family farm <clears throat> in Wisconsin went bankrupt when the first post-war waves of industrialization swept through the heartland, changing everything. Without the new skills to support his family, Curtis's father died a pauper. Curtis himself, pictured here, never received anything more than an eighth grade education. After his father's death, Curtis became obsessed with photography. He taught himself how to work a camera, moved the remnants of his family to Seattle, and started a photography studio. It was there, after taking a picture of Chief Self's eldest daughter, Angeline, as she dug for clams, that Curtis got the idea for his project. To make the volumes marketable, Curtis photographed the American Indians in their authentic environment. 
This meant he selected ornaments, clothing, and played with light to reinforce his subject's essential solitude. He removed parasols, suspenders, cars, clocks, leather shoes. He never photographed them in towns or on reservations. Oops. And he never, unlike other documenters, photographed them in mixed marriages or families like this one. Whoops. <laughs> Like this one. He refused even to, that you can take the time off from that too. He refused even to categorize a mixed race child as American Indian, culture and appearance being, to Curtis, inherently linked. As someone who is mixed race myself, I found this troubling. Curtis's argument is evolutionary. The true American Indian must live isolated from whites. Because such isolation is impossible, the tribes are doomed to disappear. Rather than show them surviving through mixed blood or culture, Curtis preferred to believe that they, perhaps like his father, were the last remnants of a pre-modern age. They would be a vanishing race. Considering the scope of his project, Curtis needed translators. He chose this man named Alexander Upshaw. Upshaw, the son of a Crow chief, was born on a reservation in Montana, but raised at the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. There he was taught to proselytize the school's party line. The future of the American Indian was to assimilate into the cultural and religious life of white Christian America. It was the only way they could become citizens. This belief seemed to have changed over the course of Upshaw's life, however. Several years after graduation, he married a white woman and had mixed daughters. Neither white nor crow, his family's appearance meant that they would be perpetual outsiders. Hard as he tried to assimilate, Upshaw found himself punished for their differences. Upshaw also became deeply conflicted about his work for Curtis, seeing the power and nobility of Curtis's unassimilated vision but also repelled by the ways that Curtis mistreated his native guides. It may seem odd that a man who believed in the necessity of assimilation would work for someone so committed to cultural isolation, but both Curtis and Upshaw were, I think, obsessed with the same question. What does it mean to be an authentic representative of one's heritage and place? On top of that, are some people meant by race to disappear. <coughs> On the surface, my family doesn't have much in common with either Curtis or Upshaw. My mother is a second generation Chinese American, not an American Indian. Neither of my parents is interested in photography, and while my family hails from Seattle, we had no intimate knowledge of Curtis's influence on our city. But my parents do understand the questions Curtis and Upshaw wrestled with. These are questions asked of any mixed minority or immigrant family. How much of yourself is not American? What happens if you don't speak the other language, follow its customs, marry into its bloodlines? What happens when all you have, or all your children have, is the appearance of difference, but none of its cultural trappings? And if you really thought you could define what it means to be truly one thing and not another, how could you represent that for yourself or someone else? In other words, what do you see when you look at me? What is it that you want me to be? On top of that, my father, like Curtis, was obsessed with theories of race and evolution. He particularly liked the bell curve and used this book to lecture my mother and me about how certain races were smarter than others, more flexible, more likely to thrive in the modern economy. Luckily, Asians rank high in the bell curve. <laughs> Higher than whites, a fact which chagrined my father, both proud of and dismayed by my mother's success. For my father, the world seemed suddenly flooded with minorities in his workforce, on the TV, at the dinner table. For a man who grew up in a conservative time and place, this baffled him. Though he adored us, my father also saw himself as overshadowed, a vanishing spouse at home, a vanishing race at his job. 
He liked to tell us that women and minorities were ruining the country. This made for an interesting family life. <laughs> Looking at Curtis's photographs against my father's anxieties, imagining Upshaw's evolving attitudes against my mother's feelings, analyzing the absence of mixed families from the record, I see what all of us have in common. It is the terror of disappearing, that what we are, how we live and appear, vanishes in the instant it is recorded. Disappearance marks Curtis's photos. Over the course of his project, both his aesthetic and his pl glass plate technology became outdated. Curtis's family split apart, financially ruined by his project. The North American Indians volume, Indian volumes disappeared from view, lost to ba basements and the back rooms of private libraries. And finally, Upshaw, photographed here, is murdered outside the Crow Reservation by whites trying to stop him from lobbying for stronger tribal rights. What disappears? We do, of course. In the end, the questions that obsess me are the same as theirs, or I imagine that they are. The world slipping past, abandoning each of us in turn. This is what Curtis's photographs show. But who gets to survive, and what determines the record? In other words, when I looked at them, what was it I was already prepared to know? And that is it. Um, <laughs> OK, so I will hit one of these buttons. This is the camera. Not that one. <laughs> ah, that one, OK. Um, so that's basically that project, and I guess I move over there now. Um, thanks. Top 29. All right. Thank you. So let me know if you can hear me. Can you all hear me? Everyone's basically hearing me? OK. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's the book. I'm going to read one or two really quick sections from it, and then I'm going to read some poems. So like I said, uh, it is hard to excerpt in a, in a way that's natural, but these are a few sections um, from my fictional rendering of what Alexander Upshaw's life might have been like, what might have actually influenced some of his decisions uh, later on. And like I said, he was raised in the Carlisle Indian School. And these are some of the uh, scenes that I have to fictionally imagine might have happened to him. <clears throat> Translator, 1881. The dormitory halls ring like Babel. So many tribes here, so many languages. Fights break out. Children split themselves according to who can understand them, crawl into the beds of cousins, brothers, sisters, but the teachers separate them again, scolding, and march them to their separate dormitories. Speak English. The first days they are chastised if they won't talk. They are refused food or struck. Then they are isolated. In the cafeteria, the newest recruits sit in silence during prayer, staring into their jelly glasses full of milk. In glass, white letters are cursived onto the blackboard. John has a ball. Kate has a cat. Upshot watches one boy's mouth twist itself with the language, tongue retracting as if he's tasted something bitter. For a long while, Upshaw pretends he can't say anything. One day, a girl needs to leave the classroom to be sick, can't say it to the teacher, and vomits down her uniform. The teacher slaps her. After this, Upshaw does what his grandmother taught him. At night, he begins whispering in Suin, then saying the English, working the other children's fingers into his. Other Crow and the Cheyenne, also knowing it, begin to hand talk. Even students who have been here years and are fluent in English pick it up. Sign language spreads like fever. The teachers cover the students' hands. Speak English. Upshaw's name is two tongues now, translator. The teachers wrap his hands with rulers. One, trying to be innovative, makes him wear mittens. In the parade yard, the newest recruits march in rows, baffled, staring. Speak English, the teachers drone, herding them through the drills. The sound, as it echoes through the grounds, a restless lowing. Not Rachel. 
The children are given names in English upon arrival. Alexander, being Alexander, keeps his own. All the others are marched past the principal who taps each student jauntily on the shoulder, appointing them a name. Jonathan, Augustus, Catherine, Hope. One Apache girl won't take it. Not Rachel, she says when he taps her shoulder. Hair in a long, blunt straggle, her uniform skirt hem already undone. Not Rachel, she insists when she passes the monitors, the teachers, the priest who comes to bless them for chapel. She snaps when the priest gets close, lunging for his hands, her teeth bared. She has small, sharp teeth, very white in her dark face that seems, no matter how long she remains indoors, never to pale. She's dragged out from under desks, out of the janitor's closet, off window sills she tries to jump down from. Dumb as an animal, a teacher hisses. No, she hisses back. She fingers their pockets, looking for keys. They slap her hands and she slaps back. No, she shrieks, tearing at her buttons. It doesn't matter that the teachers say this is for her good. It's a dark story the students hear on Sundays, how if they refuse to be Americans and be good, they will have fallen. The world will roll on ahead, leaving all the rest in the dust. Not Rachel yanks her hair out of its braid. She chews on her collar, tears her olive dress halfway down her body before the teachers rush to cover her. You have a choice, one of them cries, exasperated, attempting to pin the girl's flailing arms. Be good or be punished. Not Rachel yells back. No. She twists herself in the teacher's grip. She bites and bites. Dog. Upshaw speaks so well, some of the other crow have begun to torture him. Listen to this ghost talk, their leader snickers. The leader's American name is Robert, but his name at home could be translated as Broken Shield. He is the one the teachers punish, the older boy who won't read and so has been held back grade after grade. Broken Shield has a scar on his neck as sinuous as rope. He's stronger than Upshaw. He backs the small boy into a wall and kicks at his feet. Even his tongue is white, he shouts in crow. To prove it, he tells one of the others to grab Upshaw's face, knock his chin up with the flat of a hand so that startled tears run down Upshaw's cheeks. Someone grabs his arms and holds him. Broken Shield begins to pry his mouth open, fingers clamping down on his nostrils so that Upshaw's mouth pops open as he gasps for air. Broken Shield hisses something to the one next to him, and a pair of hands begin rooting in Upshaw's mouth as his tongue is yanked forward. Drool puddles up from his mouth, spills in thick rivulets down his chin. It runs off the fingers holding his tongue, but still the hand maintains its grip. Look, look and see if his tongue is white. He begins to struggle and flail, but his arms have been pinned tightly, and now his whole body is being lifted, feet kicking off the ground as more and more children press against him, pushing him up. Upshaw's body wriggles like a trout. He manages to pull his tongue back from the fingers, but now another hand digs in, nails clawing at his gums. His tongue feels like it is tearing off from its root. Upshot makes a retching sound. He's a dog, one of the children cries, delighted at the sound, and the children set up a chorus of coyote-like howls. Tears have begun to run into his ears. He's a dog, the children scream. A dog, a dog. And another hand grabs for his mouth. So that's school. Um, anyway, I'm going to just read some poems from Animal Eye because I know that uh, we have to stop pretty soon. So this, um, just read a couple of poems from the collection. The first one is called, um, well, it's sort of a joke, I guess. It's my husband loves this poem because it's is a poem for him, but uh, the title is "Why Some Girls Love Horses." <laughs> and then I thought. Can I have more of this? Would it be possible for every day to be a greater awakening? More light, more light. Your face on the pillow with the sleep creases rudely fragmenting it. Hair so stiff from paint and sheetrock it feels like the dirty short hank of mane I used to grab on Dandy's neck before he hauled me up and forward. White flanks flecked green with shit and the satin of his dander. The livingness, the warmth of all that blood just under the skin and in the long thick muscle of the neck. 
He was smarter than most of the children I went to school with. He knew how to stand with just the crescent of his hoof along a boot toe and press incrementally his whole weight down. The pain so surprising when it came, its iron intention sheathed in stealth, the decisive sudden twisting of his leg until the hoof pinned one's foot completely to the ground. We'd have to beat and beat him with a brush to push him off, that hot insistence with its large horse eye trained deliberately on us to watch. Like us, he knew how to announce through violence how he didn't hunger, didn't want, despite our practiced ministrations, too young not to try to empathize with this cunning, this thing that was and was not human we must respect for itself and not our imagination of it. I loved him because I could not love him any more in the ways I taught myself, watching the slim bodies of teenagers guide their geldings and figure eights around the ring as if they were one body, one fluid motion of electric understanding I would never feel working its way through fingers to the bit. This thing had a name, a need, a personality. It possessed an indifference that gave me logic and a measure. I too might stop wanting the hand placed on back or shoulder and never feel the desired response. I love the horse for the pain it could imagine and inflict on me. The sudden jerking of head away from halter, the tentative nose inspecting first before it might decide to relent and eat. I loved what was not slave or instinct, that when you turn to me, it is a choice. It is always a choice to imagine pleasure might be blended, one warmth bleeding into another as the future bleeds into the past. More light, more light, your hand against my shoulder, the image of the one who taught me disobedience is the first right of being alive. I see these books actually as sort of paired because both books are about perception um, and looking at things that are sort of not you, but we always end up doing sort of the, the kind of classic pathetic fallacy, of looking at animals, looking at the natural world, and sort of reflecting what we want on it. Um, and I have three really large dogs, and they're really a pain in the ass, to be honest. <laughs> but, but it's fascinating to live, those of you who've lived with animals, um, you know, there's a really odd relationship you develop with them because they are and are not you know, especially the domesticated animals like horses and, and cats and dogs, you end up having these sorts of, you know, relationships with them, knowing their personalities, having long sort of philosophical arguments sometimes with them, you know, when, when no one else is around to listen to you. And <laughs> so my dogs hate me actually now. But, um, but I just find that, um, that living with animals has been uh, one of those things that is a surprising change in my life and, and a change in my perception. So I'm just going to read two more poems. Um, from the book, and most of these poems do involve animals in some way. Um, but I'll read another poem, actually, that only has, yeah, Ooh, maybe not that one. Um, this is actually a poem sort of for the friend I think that we all have where you know, you, there's always that friend who is... Um, always depressed <laughs> and you're always you're always supposed to make that person feel better somehow and um, every time you see this friend you, you kind of want to die a little inside and everyone's like yes I know and I'm probably sitting next to this person right now and I can't say it anyway so this poem is for that person that person in your life that special someone it's called happiness <laughs> happiness I have been taught never to brag, but now I cannot help it. I keep a beautiful garden, all abundance, indiscriminate, pulling itself from the stubborn earth. Does it offend you to watch me working in it, touching my hands to the greening tips or tearing the yellow stalks back so wild the living and the dead both snap off in my hands? The neighbor with his stuttering fingers, the neighbor with his broken love, each comes up my drive to receive his pitying, accustomed consolations, watches me work in silence a while, rises in anger, walks back. 
Does it offend them to watch me not mourning with them, but working fitfully, fruitlessly, working the way the bees work, which is to say, by instinct alone, which looks like pleasure? I can stand for hours among the sweet narcissus, silent as a point of bone. I can wait longer than sadness. I can wait longer than your grief. It is such a small thing to be proud of, a garden. Today there were scrub jays, quail, a woodpecker knocking at the white and black shapes of trees, and someone's lost rabbit scratching under the barberry. Is it indiscriminate? Should it shrink back, wither, and expurgate? Should I, too, not be loved? It is only a little time, a little space. Why not watch the grasses take up their colors in a rush like a stream of kerosene being lit? If I could not have made this garden beautiful, I wouldn't understand your suffering, nor care for each the same inflamed way. I would have to stay only like the bees, beyond consciousness, beyond self-reproach, fingers dug down hard into stone, and growing nothing. There is no end to ego with its museum of disappointments. I want to take my neighbors into the garden and show them, here is consolation, here is your pity. Look how much seed it drops around the sparrows as they fight. It lives alongside their misery. It glows each evening with a violent light. Um, and this is the last poem I'll read. And since the first book um, I was reading from is called Intimate, this is a poem called Intimacy. Um, and it references the, um, that David Cronenberg fl uh, film, The Fly, if you know that one. <laughs> Intimacy. How horrible it is, how horrible that Cronenberg film where Goldblum's trapped with a fly inside his material transformer. Bits of the fly, bits of the man emerging gooey, many-eyed, bits of the fly worrying that his agent screwed him. I almost <laughs> flinch to see the body later that's left its fly in the corner. I mean, the fly that's left its body, recalling, too, that medieval nightmare, resurrection, in which each soul must scurry to rejoin the plush interiors of its flesh, pushing through, marrying indiscriminately because heaven won't take what's only half one soul blurring forever into another body. If we can't know the boundaries between ourselves in life, what will they be in death, corrupted steadily by maggot, rain, or superstition, by affection that depends on memory to survive? People should keep their hands to themselves for the, for the remainder of the flight. Who needs some stranger's waistline, joint problems, or insecurities? Darling, what I love in you, I pray, will always stay the hell away from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. What the film buff in me has to ask is there significance to the fact that you've illustrated your family life with a still from the movie Westworld. <laughs> uh, which is about rich vacationers who act out their fantasies in a high-tech reconstruction of the old U.S. people like flying robots. No, but now I'm so going to steal that and say absolutely. <laughs> that is exactly why I chose it. No, God, I'm, I'm so much happier. I just could only find, you know, you know, I was just looking for a fight scene. I was looking for a Charlie Chaplin fight scene, actually. That, book, that image does not show up in Intimate. There's a couple of images in the PowerPoint that don't show up in there, and that's one of them. But I was looking for a kind of fight scene that actually did not involve my parents. Um, so when I when I looked on online, I was like, oh, that's perfect. It's you know cowboys. So, but yeah, no, that's even better. I'm totally I'm totally taking that on the road. I'll be like, well, if you know anything about films? <laughs> Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to write about your parents? While they're Probably alive. You talk to them frequently, right? And, mm -hmm. and so, just how, what is that like for you? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. It's sort of the question when you're a memoirist, too. When, when those you write about are alive and literate, um, <laughs> how do you get away with this? It's, you know, I, I've always offered to show them the drafts of everything. And what's interesting is that consistently they say no, um, probably. And, and they say, you know, you should have the freedom to do this. It did um, come back to bite me uh, with my first book, The Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, where um, <laughs> I had written a story about a beloved family 
uh, history that turned out to be completely false. And I write this, this essay talking about you know, why we want this story to exist. It was this very elegant, wonderful story about um, my grandfather had a laundromat, and he supposedly got this laundromat from a Japanese-American businessman who was going and being interned. And you know, the, the Japanese businessman said, you know, just give it back to me on my return. They shook hands, and that's supposedly what happened. It turned out that that is completely made up. Not one aspect of that is true, except for the laundromat. Um, that which he did have. And so I write about why that was. And my mother, it was published in the New York Times Magazine. And, you know, and my mother read it and she was furious because she thought that I was calling her a liar. And the, the point was not to call her a liar, but to talk about sort of the beauty of that story, why all of us, including myself, wanted to believe it. Um, and that even if it's not true, to a certain extent, carrying that story forward and making it true as a cultural a family sort of, you know, this, these are the kind of people we are, this is the way we think, um, is also important. But, um, you know, with Intimate, this book, you know, my mom was really happy because she's like, well, that first book is about me, so, you know, write about your dad. <laughs> so, so this is the companion book. This is about dad. She's like, oh, I'm going to tell all my friends now, you know. She's like, I'm going to get mine. You know, because what's really funny also about it is that um, my mother always is like, that book is fiction. It's just short stories, just short stories all the time. To be, and, you know, when, you know, when you're a writer, um, it's sort of awkward in general because when people say, oh, you're a writer, have you ever written anything I've read? And you say, well, maybe, and you list all the books. And they're like, no, I've never heard of you, ever. Um, and people constantly say that to me. But weirdly, my mother, everywhere she goes, someone comes up to her and says, are you, are you related to Paisley Rectal? I mean, this never happens to me, ever. But my mother gets it all the time, and my mother is furious because she's just, and they always say, are you the mother from that book? And she's like, no, it's fiction. Um, so. So she, but she still hasn't learned the lesson, which is you can look at these books ahead of time and you know excise or whatever. But she's like, no, no, I don't want to. Um, and well, my grandmother got a hold. My grandmother's 98, and she just stopped driving, much to everyone's relief. But anyway, she's she's a real reader. She loves books, but she hates poetry. Like most people hate poetry. I totally understand that. I get I get that. So so she was, but she's really obsessed. She herself, I did not know my grandmother was obsessed with Edward Curtis. So when this book came out, and she read it, and I thought, well, she might not like it because she's in there too she called me up and she was just like oh I loved this book it's so good and boy did I learn about your father boy did I learn about your father you know so um, it's a real danger writing about your family and I guess you know many of you in the room who are writers would know that um, so that's one great thing about poetry is that you know you can write anything you want and no one will ever read it and even if they do read it they won't understand it because they'll think it can't possibly say that you know everyone always feels stupid when they pre approach a poem so if you want to really get the dirt I, I recommend not going to memoir but going to poetry because you get the best of both worlds you get to write about what you want you get to publish you get the praise and and your family never knows what just went down. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? When you use the uh, Petra Kucha, mm -hmm. uh, that brought to mind, I have some uh, colleagues who teach English composition, and they've used that as a mm. way to, well, to teach, you know, finding your own voice. That's a funny idea. And uh, I, I teach uh, freshman speech, and you know, we have sort of the same problem trying to convince students or show them how finding your own voice is valuable, not just for instrumental reasons. That is, you know, that I can use it on a job or something. So as a teacher, as a pedagogue, um, had, do you have things that you do that uh, help students catch a vision for why they should find their own voice? Probably not. Um, I, I'm just trying to think, God, what do I do? What do I do as a teacher? Um, I don't know. I, I, I've never really thought, your question is so intriguing to me because it really marries that idea of form and content in the classroom. And that's something I always end up talking about with a piece of writing, but I never think of teaching in that way. I always think, you know, I'm just going to teach them to read closely and hopefully that'll just disseminate into something wonderful later on. Or, you know, you know I've spent my entire life in, as a workshop leader with you know students poems and sort of saying do you do you know what you're really writing about that seems to be my big thing which is this is what the poem seems to be arguing that may be outside of your control and and getting them to to realize what material they're they're almost unconsciously tapping into but your question is so interesting because I just thought well yeah maybe there is a way to really truly marry form and content as a teacher um, you know maybe if I did Pecha Kucha's 
more in my classroom, that would help. I mean, it would at least, I mean, I, this is the first Pecha Kucha I've ever written. Um, and I've gone to Pecha Kucha nights. I mean, they're like really popular. I don't know if you guys have them here. But you know, artists have just, just got, run wild with this form. And it's fabulous. And I love it. Um, but I've never thought of it as a truly teaching technique. And now I wonder, God, maybe it might be more effective. Um, because it, what was both exciting for me is you know, creating this and then also dismaying was that you know, Intimate is a 300 page book. And to a certain extent, I kind of got all the major themes out in like seven minutes. I'm like, oh, maybe it was overwritten. You know? um, so, but, but I do think, at the very least, maybe trying to teach that kind of a literary form, or just think, thinking about literary forms and how, the, how they guide expression, what they allow people to do, how they crystallize thought and get to the heart of the matter, that, that's something I might take away. But now you've just. I haven't really answered a question. I've just now I'm really fascinated and and about that pedagogically. And I guess I'll just go about, back and think about it more. What do I do? Yeah. I was just going to ask you about how the business of being a writer has affected you. You know, when everybody starts out, they're just excited to get a poem published or an article published. And after that, it's a straight you, downhill. Yeah. yeah, right. And, and then you get recognition and you move up from one job to another or what have you and. Everything gets more kind of um, <laughs> implicated. I just wondered if you had any thoughts for some of our students who are in writing programs or a publishing program. Yeah, it's not good news, I think. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, well, it's good and bad news. I mean, I think that question fascinates me constantly now. Because one of the things, when I, f I remember very clearly when I was um, an undergraduate and then a graduate student, very young, and so excited, I just thought, oh, the, my world would just be so awesome if I ever had some poems published. Then you get some poems published, and you're like, oh, it would just be so great if I had a collection published. And then you get your collection published, and you're just like, that's fabulous. And then three months later, you're like, hmm, it would be so great if I went to MacArthur. You know, like it just, it, <laughs> the, the problem is that it, the ambition constantly moves. I mean, and that's, I think, so I think the really, for me, the long-term challenge is, how to, A, not let a kind of external ambition fuel the internal delight of the writing process itself. I mean, that's the hard thing, too, is that you know, you know, before when I was writing, I, I, it was just such a wonderful and unconscious and fun process. And now, to a certain extent, what's crept in is this idea of like, well, what am I going to do with that? Is that going in a book? Is that going to go into an article? Is that going to be something that I publish? And then as soon as I think that, I'm done. It's almost, you can almost hear the switch go off in the poem, and the thing just falls dead to the floor. So writing is actually, even though I have more time, and I'm encouraged to do it more, and my job is about that, in some ways it's harder to do because um, it's harder to get into that space of not ever having been a writer before that allows me to write. The, the, so that's sort of the bad news for all of you who are writing, that as you get more success and more established as writers, um, it gets harder to do sometimes. And it takes the joy sometimes out of reading, because then you look at other people's writing and you think, oh, I totally would have cut that, or why is that there? You look at it in a very craftsman-like way. Um, but the good news is that also it really asks those hard questions, which is, why am I writing? And um, I, you know, I was talking with Renee in the car last night, and we were talking about you know, promoting your first book. And the same energy that goes into the promotion of a book goes into the creation of something. And then you, you're, asked, you're faced with a choice. And I have to say, I'm, I really love knowing that at the end of the day, I don't care quite so much about the, you know, the publication or whatever. If I can just get to be a better and better and better writer, that's all that matters. And that, I thought, would disappear as I got more professionalized. But in fact, it's become stronger. Like, I'm willing to give more things up if I can actually spend the time writing. Um, so yes, it would be nice to win something like MacArthur. But the thing is, I mean, it doesn't matter to me as much as if I, got to, if I got to the end of my career and I haven't changed as a writer, I would just hate myself. I would just feel like I had failed. But if every book is better, every poem gets to a place that I couldn't have gone before, that's the only thing that matters. And, and it sounds really goopy and Oprah-like, but I think it is true. And, and, and it has to be true, I think, over the long haul. Oh, the NPR thing. Uh, well, yeah. Oh, the NPR thing. OK, so um, National Public Radio. And I wanted to be in radio when I was uh, in school. I, that was my thing. And I actually worked um, 
as an editor and you know splicing the tape before they had the digital things and stuff. So NPR, when NPR you know emailed me and I was living in Vietnam at the time and they're like, we want you to do this and I was, it was like you know my heroes had called and said, would you do something? And I was like, yes, I will do anything for NPR. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. So um, and I said yes before I realized how really bad an idea it was because what they do is they they get a poet, one poet a month, and they bring that poet out to NPR and you're supposed to attend the meetings and see how news is made. It's a bit like watching sausage get made, actually. Um, and you sit in these rooms and you go to the meetings and you look at the board and they say, we have to fill this space. And you know they talk about like what news they might put on to fill this space and what news doesn't get on. Um, and you're supposed to go and follow these reporters around, listen to the news that they've created, and then write a poem in two hours, not even a day, just two hours, start to finish, then read it in front of the nation, um, and hope that it doesn't make you sound like a raving idiot. Um, and, you know, let's be honest, most of us do sound like raving idiots. Like, if you look at the list of um, the poems that have come out, they've got great poets. I mean, you know, and me. But um, they had you know, a list of really, these really great poets, and I was reading them, and some of them were just amazing poems. And then some of them, you know, they were a, a poem someone wrote in two hours. And so I just thought, well, whoever goes before me, I just got to be better than them. And so I was really, you know, the whole month before, I was like, oh, God, let it be. You know, then they were like, it's Robert Pinsky. He was like, no, it's going to be but, and, and he is a wonderful poet, but he wrote a terrible poem. He wrote a terrible poem. So I was like, yes, I, I don't have to be good. I have to be better than Robert Pinsky at this point. So, so I go in that room, and it was terrifying. It was utterly terrifying, because you're, you're looking around. You're just like, I've got to be inspired by something good. And I was terrified of two things. One is that the Newsday would have, like, another 9-11. Uh, and, and, and I would be somehow responsible for that. And I, I thought, well, if that happens, I think they would just cut, you know, they would get rid of the new, news poet, right? Um, but then the other thing what I was terrified was if nothing happened. And it was actually the second. So I go in there, and, and they said, wow, there's nothing going on. This news sucks today. There's nothing. This is really boring. Good thing we got a poet. You know? <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, oh, this is so bad. So I noticed on the whiteboard that one of the ec uh, editors was a guy named Rick. Um, and it was like, should Rick go to Texas or not? Because he was one of, the report one of the editors, and he got this really plum job down in Texas um, public radio. And they were really hilarious reasons, like um, Texas, lots of oil, pro, you know, and then, you know, Colin, uh, what is that guy's name? Too hot, yeah, something like that. It was just like going back and forth and back and forth. And I thought that was really funny. And then there was a, a story, thank God, that came on about um, devices on your phone. And one was, a, was for if you're diabetic, you can now uh, figure out your levels, your insulin levels on this device on your phone. And doctors are really upset. They're like, well, when does a device on your phone or your iPad become something that actually gives you medical emergencies? You know, <laughs> like it's, it's supposed to be a medical thing. So they had this big philosophical debate, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if they had an app that would decide, should Rick go to Texas? You know, like, <laughs> like your whole life could be determined by these apps on the phone. And like the young people are like, yeah, that totally exists already. It's called the magic eight ball. What do you, you know? Um, but, but yeah, so I just thought, well, that would be fun. You know, I'll have this app on my phone, and it, you know, should Rick go to Texas? So I wrote a poem about that, should Rick go to Texas? And then I thought, well, if life was an app, what would it be called? And I was like, Sisyphus. It would be called Sisyphus. You're all, you're all in that stupid stone at the hill. You know. But anyway, um, so, so I never told anyone I did it because I thought if I, if I tank, I don't want anyone to know. And of course, you know, it's not. So everyone was emailing me like, I heard you. I heard you in that weird poem. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the news. Why'd they ask you? you know, it's like, I got this call all day long. My mom's like, well, at least you didn't write about us. So, <laughs> anyway, so that was that. Anyway, so that's, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Uh, should Rick have Texas. So.